All right, welcome back. My guest is joining me right now. He's Captain Randall Lund. Uh, he's the senior marine uh, the risk consultant at Alliance. Uh, hello, uh, Randall, and thank you for joining us. Good morning, Nancy. Good and morning. Hopefully you can hear me loud and clear. Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. Good morning, and thanks for waking up this early, <laughs> because I know it's still very early uh, where you are. So thank you for joining me today. Now, let's take a look at, of course, you released the report, Alliance released the report, and it's quite interesting. Uh, Lydia, lithium ion batteries, fire risk, and loss prevention measures in shipping. Um, I, I want to kickstart this interview by asking, really, why lithium batteries are seemingly dangerous. Like I said at the beginning of the program, uh, we're in the 21st century, and this is like the century of the battery. So much has been said about electric vehicles and uh, you know, electronic devices. Why are lithium batteries really dangerous? Well, uh, overall, I have to say, Nancy, lithium ion batteries are not necessarily dangerous uh, in, the, in the big sense. I, I, e, I mean, the, the world is turning the corner, let's say, on the sources of the energies that are required. And lithium ion batteries are filling the need around the world. Uh, and in many, many ways, they've been around for, for years in the smaller tools and that. So the lithium ion batteries, generally speaking, are quite safe. The problem becomes when we have substandard manufacturing of these batteries because the demand is so high there will always be uh you know the third markets that are looking to take advantage of the needs of the world and the needs of the economies around the world and in this case the battery uh and energy sources so what ends up happening is we're seeing uh some substandard manufacturing being done not following uh the un test uh, manual and protocols to make sure that the manufacturing is being done uh up to uh, the UN standards. And then what happens is uh, in the shipping side of things, the handling, they can be very roughly handled. They can be damaged by forklifts. They can be dropped. And there's a very thin membrane between the anode and the cathode, uh, between the two, um, you know, the two uh, electrolytes within the battery. And if that membrane is in any way, shape, or form, breached or damaged and they're leaking the anode and cathode between the two, then you will start a slow reaction. The reaction, sometimes depending on the amount of damage, can be minutes, it can be hours, it can be days. So what we're seeing, the, da the, the dangers are uh, when they're accidentally damaged, handled roughly, there's a problem with the battery that this chemical reaction takes place. Heat is giving off. It's an exothermic reaction in which the heat given off perpetuates the ongoing uh, damages, the ongoing heat, and to a point where the uh, electrolyte is flammable and the heat generated by the chemical reaction will cause them to spontaneously combust. And that can happen hours after being stowed or stuffed inside a freight container. It can be day after loaded to the ship, unbeknownst to the crew, unbeknownst to anyone that a battery fire has started within a freight container. And then usually by the time the, uh, the crew is fully aware of it, there's not an awful lot they can do depending on where it's actually stowed on the vessel and their firefighting capabilities. So the batteries themselves, overall, they have a very good reputation and unfortunately, the few that have caught the headlines have been very, very severe. Mm, okay. Um, Rondel, if we take a look at this report, why was this report necessary at this time? And uh, focusing on lithium batteries, fire risk, and loss prevention measures in shipping. Why did you come up, why did Alliance come up with this report at this time? Well, we, we actually came up with a similar risk bulletin uh, over five years ago. We started seeing some losses in, you know, forecasted that there were going to be ongoing problems until certain, uh, let's say, regulatory aspects caught up to uh, technology. So the, the requirement or the need for it was really based on the fact that we have had, although there's been a decrease in the number of actual claims 
in severe claims on board vessels. So the sheer numbers have decreased, but the quantity, the dollar amounts or the currency amount has gone astronomically uh, in the opposite direction. So overall, the cost to the insurance industry continues to rise, even though in the marine ocean line of business and the cargo business, claims, generally speaking, have been decreasing over the last 10 years. But when a claim does happen, the cost to the industry is tremendous. And, th and that's mainly due to the fact that the, you know, the container ships have gotten so large in the last 10 to 20 years. Um, and the fact that there's very little that can be done out at sea, uh, especially when they're not having early notification that a fire has occurred or something is going wrong with a container. You know, when you get a 20,000 TEU vessel and this container is stowed, you know, six high on deck when nobody can reach it, it's hard to access. It's hard to even tell that something is wrong with the container. Um, it's, it's just become a problem that the losses have just required us to, to put something out to the general public, to our assureds, and looking into it. And there's, a, there's quite a few groups that are tackling the problem. In, in trying to make it safe for everybody. Mm. In fact, when I was going through your uh, bulletin, uh, your marine risk experts say that they continue to see incidents involving fires on board container uh, ships and on roll-on and roll-off uh, uh, um, vessels. If we take a look at the focus of this, uh, your report, it's really focusing more on our prevention. Uh, about the risk as well as what it, uh, the impact to uh, insurance on the writers and what have you. But let's quickly really delve into this in terms of cargo hazards and causes. Uh, what are the main causes of uh, this hazards associated with lithium ion batteries? Yeah, again, as, as I mentioned, you know, we, we start with the substandard manufacturing. Mm -hmm you know, other batteries and all, all of the devices. You know, the reputable ones out there that uh, are, are manufacturing that, uh, you know, are putting their batteries into uh, the majority of the car lines that we see that are coming out with them. You know, we're not saying that any of those industries are not doing all that they can to make the batteries safe because we know that they are. It's the substandard manufacturing of the batteries that are coming out uh, literally from places all over the world. You know, no one specific place can be noted. Um, the other thing that we're seeing is that there's no set standard on the charging of the batteries before they actually go into the transportation process, you know, into the transportation chain. Um, you know, we're recommending based on from what we've seen, 30 to 50 percent, and we're talking about the state of charge, the SOC, is, is ideal for transportation and storage while in transit. Um, you know, over temperature by short, short circuiting. And the short circuiting again can happen when they're not properly protected, uh, the cathode and anode uh, areas. Uh, short circuiting can happen if there's um, incorrect charging being done with them. And then the, the last thing we've noticed is there's, is the damage that I spoke about earlier. And when a battery is damaged, you know, whether it's punctured or crushed or somehow uh, breached, you know, the chemical reaction starts. So those are basically the four main causes we've identified. Okay. So since you've identified the four main causes, damaged battery cells over temperature of so shorter circuiting, uh, overcharging of the battery cells and substandard ma uh, manufacturing, ca can you give us like a guidance as to how we can prevent losses from these hazards or from these causes which you've mentioned? Well, I think one of the biggest, the most important thing to, to put out to industry is to have them check to make sure they're actually buying from reputable dealers, from reputable suppliers, reputable manufacturers. And there's a way they can do that because a little over a year ago, uh, the IMO required uh, test summaries, which is a document that all manufacturers should be producing and passing down the supply chain to anyone who's handling it as proof that they are following the guidelines uh, for manufacturing the batteries. So we're talking about the actual battery itself. It manufactured to certain standards, certain drop tests, compression tests, vibration tests. And these test summaries have to be made available when they're requested. 
So if you're buying lithium ion batteries, ask for a test summary. That's one of the best ways that they can um, confirm that who they're buying it from uh, is a reputable dealer. Uh, okay. Okay, Randall, let's just quickly take uh, this uh, break and I will come back at you. Uh, we are going right. All right, uh, Randall, if you, if you can still hear me, is it just about choosing a reputable manufacturer? Uh, is, is that only the way that we can prevent uh, the losses from lithium ion batteries? Are there other loss prevention measures? There are, there are indeed. And one okay. of them is, uh, you know, before accepting a shipment of lithium ion batteries, you know, you can always check what is and confirm the state of charge. If you can imagine that a battery that's charged at 50% holds a certain amount of energy, but if that same battery is uh, charged at 100%, you literally have twice the amount of energy package, uh, the fire load that could be exhibited if something were to go wrong with that battery. So always look and confirm what is the state of the charge of the battery. It should be the lowest possible charge uh, for the duration that the battery is anticipating. In other words, you know, the time it goes to a port, if it's actually an electric vehicle, the time that it gets on or is delivered down to a port, driving it onto the vessel, driving it off and getting to the final destination. The, the charging should be uh, enough state of charge uh, to make the duration of the voyage and in, in being able to be started. Uh, the other thing is, you know, we, we're not recommending that any of the and I'm speaking now just of the electrical vehicles, the EVs, uh, that they should be charged on board a vessel. Most vessels do not have that capability. And we're talking about the commercial lines, the row row vessels. So they should be in a condition where additional charging would never be needed, uh, other than maybe at a port where proper people and proper uh, connections are being made to charge that battery if it did needed to be done. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things that the industry itself is going to need to do and look at. And I know that there's an awful lot of these issues are currently being discussed uh, literally around the world. And that's, you know, we're recommending an increased monitoring of the containers which contain the lithium ion batteries on board the vessels. And, you know, in today's technology, it's not that hard to be able to put sensors within a freight container uh, and being able to be read up on the bridge or the cargo control room on board a vessel. Uh, the other thing is, is just to increase the firefighting capabilities of the vessel. You know, there's an awful lot. The vessels have gotten so large so quickly. Um, that's one area that is sort of lagged behind in the sizes of the ship. Uh, and that is the firefighting capabilities, especially when we're talking about these specialized fires uh, and getting access to the actual container itself uh, on board there. You know, there's, there's other things such as training your crew and the employees, whether they're on a ship or in a terminal yard. Uh, we're seeing fires, you know, break out at any time during the transportation chain. So everybody would need needs to know a little bit more, a little bit uh, additional training on lithium ion batteries and what is the latest and greatest measures to fight the fires. And what ends up happening is with lithium ion batteries is that they burn so intensely for such a long period of time. Yeah. Um, and they propagate very quickly from one battery to the next and they grow and they grow. Uh, and the same can be said on board a container ship uh, from one container to another container next to it, to the container above it. And next thing you know, you have four or five containers and all the cargo uh, catching on fire. I, I like you know, that. In, in regulatory, the regulatory aspect, it will eventually catch up. You know, I think we're all fairly aware that any of the regulatory agencies have certain process that they must go through to make sure, uh, you know, what the cost to industry is going to be, what the cost to uh, governments are going to be to enact new rules and laws to, to change things. And I'm talking about the actual ship construction, uh, modification from the design right at the very beginning stages of a vessel uh, that knowingly are going to be carrying these, you know, do we need a separate cargo hold? that is specially modified for monitoring these type of batteries for firefighting capabilities within these areas? Do we need to set regulations down that these batteries only need to be carried on deck in the lower tiers? So there's a lot of questions yet to be 
answer that could help not necessarily prevent, well, in addition to preventing them from occurring even to begin with, but how to minimize once something does go wrong on board a vessel. Um, Randall, for, from this report, I also read that um, it is really possible uh, to detect uh, to detect this early. And from what you said in the report, a shortage of manpower and a lack of adequate fire fighting capabilities on board. So because this is really hard to detect, that means that there should be loss prevention measures in place, as you have noted earlier. Is that? Correct. Correct. What we really, what our focus in on the insurance side and the marine side here at Allianz is, you know, if we can prevent something from happening, then everybody wins. You know, everybody who has cargo on board the vessel. Um, on board these ships that they're having problems, whether it's a roll on, roll off ship, a row row, or whether it's a containerized ship, they have gotten to such a size. The manning that is on board these vessels, and, and you have to remember, the crew that are on board a vessel, they're, they're sailors, they're seamen, they're merchant mariners, they're not firefighters. Yes, they've taken firefighting training, and yes, they can put out and they, they train every week, but these types of fires would be very difficult for even the most advanced firefighting uh, technicians to put out. And we're seeing that around the world and and, and the land even of how, how to actually put out the fire. So there's a lot of solutions. There's a lot of new uh, technology that's coming out that is hopefully going to make it easier if there is a problem on board a fire. But we would rather take the take a look at how do we prevent it to begin with? Because if we can prevent the incident from even occurring, then everybody wins. Mm. L let's talk about el electric vehicles on car carriers wi and within freight containers. Of course, the marine or the maritime industry uh, continues to be concerned by fires on board vessels that are associated with uh, lithium ion batteries in electric vehicles. I'd like you to really expand uh, on that and how this really poses uh, a, a challenge or a major risk. Well, especially on the row row vessels, you know, there are a lot of automobile manufacturers who are coming out uh, with what people are asking for. And that's the high end sports car, uh, high performance type vehicle that's electric. So with these, you have a very low clearance on many of these vehicles. And when they're being loaded and they are actually driven straight on board the ship by the uh, by the longshoremen and the stevedores, um, there is a transition up the ramp and into the storage locations. Um, the batteries are typically stowed on board or on the vessel located at the very bottom of the car. So with a low clearance, you always have to be wary of anything catching the bottom of the automobile. So when that gets loaded to the vessel and for a row row vessel specifically, they get stowed so very tightly close next to each other. One gets loaded, the driver gets out, another car pulls in right next to it, literally inches away from it, and then he gets out and exits. And that's how they load them. So the problem on the row row ships is you have a huge uh, cargo hold, similar to a great big car garage that has air coming from all sources. It's very difficult to eliminate uh, the oxygen within this cargo space. So due to the tight stowage of the cars themselves, if there is a problem with one battery on one car, it very easily uh, propagates out to the other vehicles next to it and so on and so forth. And then for the crew, number one, to be notified that there's a problem in the cargo hold with their access to the vehicle itself. How do they actually get to the vehicle to put out the fire? You know, it's one thing to have a charged hose and to make an attack and due to the low number of people, reduced number of uh, crewmen on board, you may have a fire team of three to five people. And maybe if you're lucky, a backup team. And that's just not going to be sufficient to put out the type of fire. By the time that they get down and access the cargo hold with the cars and actually get close enough to that one car, because again, the stowage is so tight, um, it makes it very difficult for any crew member, much less any 
uh, technical firefighter to get to the actual seat of the fire. We're, we're talking about this fire risk on board uh, ships, and we should also note that a lot of people uh, lose their lives. There's also environmental uh, pollution. Uh, there are also physical damages and also physical uh, financial losses. Can, can you give me an idea of how much we're talking about in terms of financial losses on board uh, ships? Because the maritime industry would is really very concerned about uh, this risk. Well, again, again, the problem goes back to, you know, access to the firefighting uh, area that needs to be done. And what happens is once a vessel realizes that the fire is well beyond their means to necessarily contain it any further, and there's a risk, as you pointed out, to the lives of the crewmen on board, there really isn't an awful lot they can do out on the high seas. Uh, and, and the other problem is, and we've seen this already, even if the vessel is somewhat near a port where help could be had uh, at the port facility itself, that various countries, for the reasons you just mentioned, environmental cost, uh, just the overall uh, feeling of bringing in a ship that's in distress on fire, not only with uh, the cargo that's on fire itself, but all the other cargo possibly burning and bringing that into a port is just a very difficult situation for port authorities, for government officials to do, for countries themselves to say, yes, let's bring these in. So unfortunately, the cost of lives, uh, we haven't seen too much yet, knock on wood, uh, in the maritime industry itself, because most of the crewmen in the incidents that have happened have abandoned ship. And then the ships, uh, you know, if they're lucky enough to get a tow line out there to try to bring it in. Uh, the other real big problem that I see is that these fires burn so intensely for so mm. many days mm. that there's rarely any evidence left for the investigators to go on and actually mm. determine uh, definitively the cause of the fire and how it spread. And especially like recently when we had the one vessel, the Felicity Ace, that ended up burning, it went under tow, and it ended up sinking. There's just no way they can access uh, and, and determine. The only thing that we know is what the crewmen on board have been able to report. And based on observations of the vessel itself, you know, from emergency crews that got out towards it. But without actual any evidence, it's very difficult to determine the origin and root cause of the fire. You know, we know, and based on the Stowe plan, what cargoes were in that area. There may have been, you know, witnesses that saw it at its infinitesimal stage and what we call the incipient stage of a fire. Um, and that would be a rare occasion because usually on a container ship or on a railroad ship, things are well developed before uh, the bridge gets even notified that there's a problem somewhere on the vessel. Okay, um, Rundle, I can see some figures here in the bulletin. Your analysis says that over 240,000 marine insurance industry claims over the past five years with a value of about 9.2 billion euros shows that fire and explosion from all causes is the most expensive cause of loss accounting for 18 percent of the value of all claims to the insurance industry is it yes okay go ahead please yeah i, I was just going to say nancy uh, Correct. To go back to your original question, the mm -hmm. cost to the industry, to the insurance industry, is becoming astronomical. It, it is actually climbing exponentially. You know, you when you consider the vessel itself and the millions of dollars in the construction cost and the value of the vessel itself, and of course, all of the cargo. And I think we, we noted that when, uh, you know, the ship uh, was stuck in the Suez Canal and the cost of all the cargo that was spoiled or damaged due to that huge delay. Cargo costs are one thing, the vessel costs are another thing. What we're seeing even more recently is the salvage cost. The cost to go out to try to save a ship, uh, and i.e. that would mean putting people on board at a tremendous risk to put out the fire, put it under, getting it under control, getting it under tow and bringing it in and then the entire discharge process, if we're lucky enough to bring a ship in 
with some cargo that is still valuable and can be salvaged, that entire process falls underneath uh, an insurance claim. And those costs are becoming literally astronomical. Uh, and again, we're talking about the environmental cost, the cleanup costs, the actual discharge costs, um, repair costs. It, it is just uh, mind blowing how, uh, how the cost of a claim of a major incident, such as a vessel on fire, um, is causing the industry. Okay, Randall, as we come to the end of uh, this interview, you said quite a lot around of uh, the fire uh, risk, also about uh, the loss prevention measures. But, but I would like you to go through really a kind of summary uh, that the maritime industry can uh, observe uh, to improve, you know, the way this risk will not get to them. I'm talking about the supply chain right now, not even just about the ships or the um, uh, vessels on board, but about the supply ch uh, chain itself. Okay, as, as we talk about the lithium ion battery supply chain, you know, the biggest thing that I'd like to put out there is, you know, if any point along the supply chain, anyone who's handling a package of lithium ion batteries, whether the small ones that go in your personal, you know, handheld devices mm. and equipment that you have in the garage, or whether it's replacement batteries for automobiles, at any point during that transportation, if a package is damaged, it should not go any further. It should not just be put back in the freight container it should not be stowed in an overpack additional box and boxed up because that chemical reaction with the lithium ion battery, as I mentioned earlier, could take days before there's enough energy being dissipated uh, to cause the chemical reaction. And then we end up with uh, what's known as a thermal runaway. And that's when things start to go wrong. So we have seen not only um, damages uh, from an incident taking place when it, when it actually happens, but hours and days later. There's a big problem I know in the, uh, with reflash. Reflashing is when a fire is put out and these lithium ion batteries, unfortunately cooling with water is currently the best method that's available because if we can slow down and stop the chemical reaction that's taking place, then we're gonna stop the propagation and sort of contain the the fire into the one location. What ends up happening is, you know, people think the fire is out and then it can relight because the chemical reaction inside the battery is still occurring. So it's so important uh, for anyone in the supply chain to make sure that no damaged packages of lithium ion batteries move anymore in the supply chain. They stop, they pull it out of the supply chain, uh, they escalate the problem and get a professional in there to evaluate the condition of the batteries themselves before they move on with them in the supply chain. So I hope that answered your question. Yes, it did. Um, Randall, I, just before I let you go, I'm a bit curious because most of us, or if not all of us, do have mobile uh, devices. And we also do know <laughs> that our phones and other mobile devices also have lithium batteries. So should we also observe this forms of safety, just like you said uh, earlier, it may not be for ships, but uh, don't overcharge and all of that, because we've even seen some explosions from these electronic devices. Some might be charging it in bed. And, you know, I think some few days ago, I saw something in the news here in Nigeria where someone was charging her phone and it exploded and she died there on, in bed. So does this also really, uh, you know, uh, talk about, can, can we relate what you're saying to mobile phones too? Nancy, I, I, I have to say, I, and, and let you know, just last week, I went to a two-day symposium uh, put on by the Fire Department of New York, FDNY, and it is unbelievable. It was such an eye-opening experience to hear the challenges that the New York City Fire Department are having with what they call the mobility devices. So, it, you know, on a much smaller scale, the scooters and the e-bikes, but the same would pertain to your phones. And really what they have noticed is an exorbitant amount of do-it-yourself alterations that are being done that are causing loss of lives. People are 
diving into the batteries. They're thinking that they can modify them. They can supercharge them. They can make them last longer. And there's industries and uh, do-it-yourself people out there starting businesses that will swap out the batteries for you. You can find batteries online, whether, uh, you know, they're from various different sources online. But where exactly is that battery manufactured from? What type of battery is that actually that's coming in? Does it meet the standards that needed to be made uh, during the manufacturing process? So our recommendation, what I learned at that two-day symposium, is no one should ever be ordering a lithium-ion battery online simply because of the price. And you will see there are many advantages to buying things online. Lithium-ion batteries is not one of them simply because you just do not know where it's coming from. And unfortunately, things like that, substandard manufacturing, again, is getting into the supply chain and is getting into home products, whether it's your phone and this and that. And, you know, I'm sure most of the listeners here, and, and including you, know that most airlines now require the standard, make sure you do not have any lithium-ion batteries in your packed suitcases. You know, they don't want those extra batteries uh, down in the cargo hold of an airplane. Uh, they want to be able to, if something were to go wrong with it, and they have learned enough to contain and control an awful lot of the smaller devices, uh, if they can access them and actually, you know, see what's happening with the actual battery device. And again, the smaller devices such as your iPhone, the energy package in that battery is not as extreme as we're talking about with the uh, electric vehicles. Yes, unfortunately, there has been loss of lives uh, due to problems with smaller devices such as your phone and your iPads and, you know, your other e-devices. Um, but that's, that is my biggest recommendation is, is go back to your original manufacturer. Make sure you're getting the proper product replacement if that's what you're trying to do with your batteries and you're using the proper charging methods uh, to charge your batteries. Mm. Follow the manufacturer's instructions. Follow manufacturer's instructions. Very necessary. Thank you very much, Randall, for uh, your, your insights uh, today. And thank you for waking up early to join us this morning. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> You're mighty welcome. Thank All you very much. Right. All yeah. right. Thank you. Bye. I've been uh, speaking with uh, Captain Randall Lund, who is the Senior Marine Risk Consultant at uh, Alliance. We've been looking at lithium batteries impact on shipping safety on vessels. We've been talking about safety measures, especially in the maritime uh, industry. For people that are involved in that industry, uh, they should have taken note uh, of uh, this. And I like that parting shot from uh, Randall that talking about phones. So some people may be saying, oh, what's Nancy saying? Shipping, shipping, how does it relate to you? It relates because we have our mobile phones, so you should uh, take note and observe all safety measures. Like you had Randall say, uh, lithium is not really a dangerous element, but the way it is being handled can be dangerous. For those of us that are chemistry students, I think lithium in the periodic table should be the second element. If I remember my chemistry again, uh, helium, lithium, beryllium, that's talking about the periodic table. But whatever it is, we should handle, especially our phones well, and for operators in the uh, maritime industry to take note of those safety uh, measures, firefighting, and as much as possible, prevent losses. Let's uh, quickly take a break. Uh, when we come back, um, the show continues. Let's see what else we can add uh, to the show. If not, we'll say our 